from? I'm from Bob. My father's from Latacino. My mother was English from Manchester. I was born in Bournemouth in the south of England. I live in Latacino now. I, I started work with Donatella when she was still in the mother company, that is Fattoria dei Barbi, in 1989. So, next month, it's 21 years wow. and I've been working for... Wow, yeah. Here we're a little... Uh, oh wait, uh, there's no need to say it. Working for Donatella is, uh, is, 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 is a great adventure. There's a great enthusiasm. She's... Um, She's never satisfied with what we've achieved today. There is always something more that we can do tomorrow. As soon as we've done an event or launched a new wine, we're ready to just not relax, but you know. No, she's already there planning the next event, the next thing. She works a great deal by night because she's not present a lot during the day anyway. She's Councillor for Tourism for the City of Siena. She's um, the Tuscan representative of women who work in wine. There's this association. There is the need for an association in Italy that groups together the women who are somehow are connected to the wine world because they sell the wines, because they make them, because they serve them. Journalists from the uh, specialised press. And every region has got a, a president for that region. So she represents the Toscana women in wine. And then she is vice president of the Inoteca Italiana, this association in Siena, in the medieval fortress. Mm, she gives several courses on wine tourism. She created in 1993 an association called Movimento Turismo del Vino, so wine tourism movement. Uh, consider that in 1993, 10% of Italian wineries were open to the public. So she started a, a, a real movement, that's the right word, to convince wineries that there was nothing to go, nothing goes amiss if you open your doors and show what you're doing. And, and that it's a, a great, it's a greater investment than buying publicity, uh, having your label printed. You, you get a better result rather than, um, well, yes, you get a better result in inviting people because then they will tell their friends and they will come back. And that's why she began the day that is called Cantina Aperte, where we keep the cellars open on the last Sunday in May from the morning till the evening non-stop with the owner in the estate, giving tours and preview tastings and organising something different rather than the regular, in any case in Italy having one who's open on a Sunday is already something mm -hmm. unique. And at a certain point of her activity as president of that association, this day called Cantina Verde or Broad Wine Day was spread to several nations, um, Sonoma or uh, in South Africa, um, in Argentina one year, uh, in Japan, it, it, it did spread um, and there were millions of tourists moving around uh, the wine regions of several nations on the same day, which was, which was great. She stopped being uh, president at the end of her 10th year and then was called upon <laughs> by Siena to be councillor for tourism, so we lost her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> These ideas of these paintings obviously are, are hers to help the tourists understand. Here in the 1500s, this time, there is an apparition of the Madonna to um, a Spanish general called Don Garcia di Toledo who was attacking Montalcino together with the Medici army. There was an alliance between uh, Spain and the Medici. Um, Montalcino was interesting for the, for the Florentine army just because they didn't win the Battle of Monteverdi didn't mean that they lost their interest in our village. We were rich and we were high up. From a strategic point of view, having Montalcino on your side would have been a great asset. This general, during the siege of Montalcino in 1553, has an apparition. He sees the Madonna, who with her cloak seems to be covering the village of Montalcino, and his horse loses all four of his horseshoes. And so, evidently being a devout Catholic, he, he takes this to be a sign from God that he must call away the troops because Montalcino is protected. You know, as if we were to puncture all four tyres of our car in the same instant, we would take that to mean something also. And that was his case. So he calls away the troops, Montalcino remains free only until 1559 when um, there is another 
peace uh, treaty, this time between the French and the Spanish. The French had been our allies up until then and obviously had the keys to the city. Through this new alliance they give the keys to, to, the, to the Spanish and the Spanish are still in great rapport with the Medici. So the keys to the city of Montalcino do end up uh, in the hands of the Grand Duke of Toscana, Cosimo Medici, through no fault of our own, not because we didn't win a battle or we were not courageous enough. In fact, we had dedicated 300 years to defending ourselves from the Medici, but through this alliance, we lose our independence. At that point, we had remained the last independent city in Italy, but we have to come to terms with the fact that that city is finished. We too are under a Grand Duchy, and we can relax and no longer have to defend the village as we have done for so long. But we realised quite rapidly that while all we've been doing is defending the village of Montalcino, our neighbours have surrendered a lot sooner than us to these Grand Duchies. Consequently, they've had time to develop new techniques of making exactly the same objects. So leather is made better somewhere else, the pottery is made more beautiful uh, elsewhere, and the prices are different. They have studied techniques which make them save time, so their uh, products are more economic than what is made in Montalcino. So we have to find another way of earning a living. And that is when we adventure into the countryside. Uh, we'd always been an industrial village. For those times, we have to reinvent ourselves as farmers. Probably we thought that it was going to be quite a, um, a simple thing. You go, you fell those trees, there are so many of them, you plant and you reap and, and that's it. We didn't know what this soil was most apt for. We didn't know um, how to alternate crops through the course of the year so that if the weather was not optimum for one cultivation, then we would have something else to depend on. So, let's say for the beginning, um, we were not great farmers and there was a great amount of poverty and, uh, and famine for those Montalcino farmers. Around the beginning of the 1700s, we've got it mastered. We understand that this uh, area is ideal for growing crops, grains um, in spring and summer, grapes in autumn for making the wine, and then in the winter we grow olives for making the oil. Basically, that is what we do today. So, we had a postcard from then. Our, our countryside is very similar, apart from the machinery, right? The fields look similar. But what is very different today to then is the quality of what we make. Because today we are concentrated on making the best possible wine, the best possible uh, wheat, the best possible oil, even at a cost of making less of it. Whereas in the 1700s what was essential was quantity. Anything that we've ever read about the past in the countryside, for them the successful harvest was when it was abundant and prosperous harvest. The quality is hardly ever mentioned. If it was also good, all the better, but it was the amount that for them was essential.